Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, thanks for being patient on the waiting room as well, trying to figure some stuff out here. Um, we are designing in color. Um, it's a group of, there's six of us in here, but some of us are kind of hiding behind the scenes. Um, anyway, for those of you that don't know what designing in color is, we are a collective of architects and designers of culture. And uh, our mission is to aim to diversify the way architecture is taught and practiced. Um, with the intent to amplify marginalized communities that have been historically silenced and erased throughout the design process. Um, and the six of us are based in different cities throughout the country. Um, my name is Olga Braca Montes. I'm based out of Phoenix. And I will shoot it over to my co-host here. Um, but before I do that, I want to let you all know that we're going to be opening up the floor for questions in the chat towards the end of the session. And then we will uh, leave it to the end to answer any questions. And we will also be um, sending a poll with a couple questions for you to answer just so that we get to know who is attending the session today. Thanks again for joining. Brian? Hey guys, uh, I'm Brian Wisniewski. Uh, I'm I, one of our DCO members in Detroit. Um, and I'm really excited tonight to introduce everyone to the idea that you've probably experienced at some point um, known as imposter syndrome. Um, I'm not going to do a whole lot of talking tonight, neither is Olga. We really have a great panel lined up um, to really unpack a lot of their experiences um, and, and really some really great diverse backgrounds. Um, I'd like to kudos uh, Nate Robert Eza. Um, he really reached out to us probably a month ago to have this conversation. And he had a lot of really honest, uh, cathartic dialogue that ended up unpackaging the concept of uh, the imposter syndrome that he experienced. And we really thought uh, the power of that needed to be shared with others. Um, and uh, Nate is actually in Indianapolis right now. You can see him on the screen. Um, his uh, side company, Too Easy Fashion Line, really promotes, um, dedicates itself to, to the empowerment of uh, designers and how it uh, is used to change people. And uh, Nate, really glad to have you tonight. Um, maybe you give a little background to everybody else about yourself. Yeah, I'm Nate Robert Aze. Um, I'm originally from Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria. I was born in Lagos. I uh, came here when I was about two years old, and we moved directly to Indianapolis, Indiana. And I actually went to college here as well in Indiana. I went to Ball State University, one of the prominent schools for architecture and design. And I got my undergrad in urban planning and development, and then went ahead and got my master's in um, urban design and so you know ever since i've been working for a company called uh, meticulous design and architecture which you know i really love the company we're doing a lot of work uh, not only just urban design work but you know, community work in uh kind of not only molding molding uh, places but molding people's minds and their mindsets and um, i also do work uh, for a company i started with a along with a co-founder named Josh Sims, um, called Too Easy. And we started it back in 2015, um, basically while we were back in school. And we basically grew a, a brand based off our love of design and you know how design can be used to inspire, impact, and change people's lives. And uh, we run a fashion show every year called the Unity in the Jungle Fashion Show. We bring a big multitude of people together to celebrate fashion um and just unity and togetherness and um so yeah i think this is definitely a conversation that needed it needed to be had um so yeah that's that's about me beautiful thank you so much uh, he brings a really nice uh fresh college grad multitude of how design urban fashion all sort of ties together um, and works with the self-expression um, that brings really to us to Roger Cummins. Um, Roger is the founder of Juxtaposition Arts in North Minneapolis. Um, and congratulations, Roger, uh, 25 fantastic years. I'm only 30, so I can only imagine how long that's been. Um, kudos to you. Um, but he's a Harvard Loeb Fellow, um, and really what their organization does is inspire kids to figure out what they're good at, entrepreneurial, creative. Um, and we're really glad to have him. So he brings a, a beautiful uh, children's angle. Roger, would you care to give a little more uh, about you and welcome to uh, uh, tonight's talk. Sure, thank you for having me. <clears throat> so I was born in Cleveland, but raised in the Twin Cities. And um, Juxta is 
is like a contemporary art and design social enterprise. So think about uh, black led and founded Media Lab slash Bauhaus, where young artists and designers from North Minneapolis and around the Twin Cities come to study uh, in the areas of uh, contemporary art, graphic design, uh, architecture, environmental design, um, mass production, cut and sew, industrial design, planning, uh, research, and aerosol writing, all taught by professional practitioners of each discipline. Um, so there's a training component, and then there's four micro businesses that we call labs, where young people are employed in those in those specific labs. Um, James Garrett is one of the founders of the uh, environmental design studio. So um, each one of these labs earns earns money that it uh, generates money uh, up to I will say altogether last year we brought in about about six hundred thousand. Um, we pay the young people uh, uh, a wage an hour. And we look at what the tipping point is um, to a low-income household uh, that really makes a difference. And then that's, then that's the goal that we shoot for into young people's pockets, into the homes in and around North Minneapolis. Awesome work there, um, $600,000. And paying the, the people, that really gives value to what they do just on an immediate basis, but long-term too. And that's a, a big thing for creative um, professionals to sort of feel worth in, in what they do. So that's awesome. Uh, last but not least, uh, James Garrett, as Roger mentioned, is a founder of the studio there. He's also um, tying into uh, another project that Roger's doing. Um, James is an AIA uh, National Architect of the Year in 2019 and runs his own studio, Formula Architects, that he founded in Minneapolis as well. They focus on transportation um, and really urban scale projects. Um, and he's been doing a lot of uh, uh, webinars and, and conversations, uh, podcasts the last few weeks, um, being there in Minneapolis. And we're really gracious that he's taken out some time uh, from his very busy schedule to, to be with us tonight. So James, welcome. Um, love for a little uh, uh, background on you as well for everybody. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just off the bat, I have to say, uh, we're in St. Paul. Oh, um, ah. So, you know, the Twin Cities are twins, but we're fraternal twins at best, and we don't always get along with each other. So there's a lot of uh, inner city rivalry, uh, friendly rivalry. So we're actually on the St. Paul side, but we do work on both sides of the river. Um, and before I get started, this, this mural behind me is, is Roger's uh, brainchild. Uh, this was the first thing that, that we had done in, in the office, uh, Roger Cummings and Takumba Aiken. Uh, rolled up and, and made the magic happen. And then we actually did the interiors of the spot. We did the colors of the walls, the ceiling, the entire studio is based on uh, the color scheme that, that, that they came up with um, in representing um, this dope art. We asked them to, to make this space fruitful and to ask the ancestors for permission to be creative here. And that's what they came up with. And it's been here 13 years. Um, and uh, it's still just as dope as day one. So I gotta, I gotta give him, him props on, on that. Uh, Roger's a frequent co-conspirator. Um, he's never seen a project where I've wanted to do some undermining of white supremacy and, and uh, the sort of global uh, system of oppression where he, he hasn't jumped in and been like, where are we at? What are we doing? Um, we also have aerosol backgrounds. Roger uh, is, a, is a graph writer, and I come out of that tradition as well. So um, we linked up, you know, we've known each other since, since high school, and uh, we roll together, and uh, we collaborate on all types of urban interventions from, you know, visual art to architecture and, and everything in between. So uh, just a quick bit about me. I was born in um, Charlotte Amalia in, in Las Islas Virgenes and Las Islas Amidiamente al lado de Puerto Rico. So I moved here to the United States, um, you know, to the mainland when I was little. And uh, my mom is, is from here, uh, my, mom, my mom's side of the family, uh, five generations um, from St. Paul. And so, uh, you know, I've been here, uh, my wife and I have, have two boys, and so they're the sixth uh, generation um, to be raised here in St. Paul, Minnesota. So we have deep ties uh, to the community. And, uh, 
18 years ago, uh, uh, we created a small uh, design lab where we were really experimenting with all aspects of um, urban design and, and, and urban influence. And it was architecture, it was a little bit of planning and you know all kinds of visual art. And basically this has grown into a full service architecture firm um, called Formula, Form Plus Urban Landscape Articulation, which uh, sort of describes exactly what we do here. We work in three sort of major uh, facets. We look at technology, sustainability, and art as ways to uh, really affect the built environment. So um, glad to be here. I uh, appreciate you guys reaching out and uh, looking for uh, a fun uh, evening of dialogue tonight. So. Awesome, thanks James. Um, I really appreciate the, the interplay of all the modes of design um, in one. Um, Olga comes from a school that's got everything um, uh, built into their program at ASU. So um, I know she definitely um, supports and she's got an urban design degree, I think she said too. So um, really exciting. Um, so into the meat of the, the conversation, the topic tonight, um, imposter syndrome, for those of you who don't necessarily know per se the uh, official definition uh, is typically some sensation of unbelonging, um, a focus on, um, you know, only succeeding because of luck and not really because of your talents. Um, and it's an awareness that someone is consistently um, stressed by or acknowledges that it's physiological, it's psychological, and it's something that you may notice in moments, but it tends to carry for a long duration. Um, and I think part of the survey when Ruben launches it here um, is gonna ask those questions at what point or how, how large do you feel that sensation is. Um, and I'd like to start with at least Nate um, as the sort of co-founder uh, of this conversation. Um, what, uh, what your experiences have been and, and when those first uh, triggers might have been towards uh, unbelonging, fraudulent, illegitimate, um, especially as it relates to design, which is what most of our audience is here. So. Sure. <clears throat> so I can I can remember the kind of the earliest, um, and I think it it kind of contributes to you know how I felt in an urban I mean in a design um, setting. But I can think of the kind of the early stages of it, and I'm gonna kind of skim through that a little bit just to give you an understanding of like um, how it all came about. Um, I believe personally it started when I, like, from the transition to, from middle school to high school, because um, by the time I was going to high school, I realized that I didn't want to go to the school around me, which was, in Indianapolis, it's called Northwest. I don't know if anyone on the, on the live is from Indianapolis, but if you know what Northwest High School is, you know, it's there's some connotations about that school, some negative connotations about that school. Uh, so I didn't want to go there. And we decided that, um, well, I decided that I wanted to go to a school called Ben Davis, which is a more you know, established school. I it was, had a better sports program. I played um, basketball at the time. And so I, I decided that, you know, I wanted to go there. And at the time, I couldn't really go there because I wasn't living in, this, in the district that would allow you to, to go to the school. So basically what we had to do is um, sign up for like admission for the school under another address so that one of my friends could actually, you know, take me, uh, his mom could actually take us to school at, at Ben Davis. So as I was going to that school, I think that was kind of like the early stages, you know, because already you know because of what i had to do to get into the school you know i did not really feel a sense of belonging just to be honest um and so like i said that i think was the early you know the early stages of it because you know even like the cultures you know didn't really they weren't the same you know coming from northwest and coming from you know that area over there on 34th and bowler you know and and going to uh ben davis there was a full shift of paradigm in terms of like, you know, how people behaved, um, how people took their academics, 
like seriously and things and how the whole sports world worked. Um, so the whole time I was there, you know, I felt that. And I ended up leaving actually my junior year because of, you know, different circumstances um, and going back to actual, you know, Northwest. And I feel like it kind of stuck with me, you know, as I, when I went to Northwest, even though I still felt like, you know, this is where I'm supposed to be. But by the time I got to college, you know, it really started hitting because um, when I first got to Ball State University, um, first of all, when I, when I was doing my sort of like trying to get into the architecture school, um, I had a certain uh, admissions uh, assistant or admission, um, the person who basically helps you like pick your classes and everything. And they're supposed to advisor, uh, uh, academic advisor that basically told me that I wasn't in a way that I wasn't fit to, to do architecture. You know, I, I explained like, you know, what I was into and all those things and that I wanted to do architecture. And they kind of hit me with the, maybe you should look into like graphic design or maybe you should look into like, you know, construction administration or something like that. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I didn't like really ask you for a change in, you know, for what I should do career-wise. I asked you to help me get where I'm trying to go. And so that was a huge problem. But when I actually finally wiggled my way to get in the school um, of architecture and planning, um, there were a lot of roadblocks. Uh, I can remember my first day in uh, architecture, uh, basically architecture 101, uh, architecture 100, I guess. Um, it seemed like I was like on a roller coaster, like with no type of seatbelt on. <laughs> Like literally, like every like things were moving so fast. I felt like I had no control at all over anything. My classmates were um, raising their hands, answering questions, and you know I look around and I see all these people, and you know they're talking about how their dad is an architect or how they took architecture classes in, in high school and all these different types of things. And I'm just like trying to catch up, you know. So that's when it really, really got intense for me, um, and I realized that you know, this is not going to be a cakewalk. And everybody knows that architecture school isn't like easy or like, you know, any type of like design school is not easy. Um, but, you know, it, it seemed hard to a point where like, it got me thinking a lot, like, am I supposed to be here? Like, and that thought kind of lingered throughout my whole uh, college career pretty much until I would say my senior year it lifted a little bit because I had some ties with the faculty and things like that, where I got more confidence. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it was still there. I, I know it was still there because I, I can tell it didn't really lift until I got into my professional career. Um, well, actually in, in urban design, when I got my master's in urban design, it lifted pretty much like mostly. But then when I actually got into my career and I you know got around people who uh, think like me and who are willing to give me an opportunity to not only just uh, pitch ideas, um, not only contribute to the conversation, but also give me the opportunity to actually design and make an impact in, in ways that I, I would have never thought that, you know, I would have been able to make, especially so early on in my career. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like an introduction to it. I don't know how far deep we want to go because I can get I can get deep into it, but I, I just, you know, that's basically an introduction. No, I think that's uh, very well put. Um, and, and again, I appreciate you for collaborating on this with us uh, up front. Um, you know, as one who went to two schools uh, or the same school for two degrees, uh, you know, James, I think you went to different parts of the, the country for that. How did your experience, uh, you know, perhaps relate to that or um, especially finding those roadblocks initially. I mean, for me, I, I found a lot of roadblocks uh, from high school. Um, you know, I couldn't get into the architecture course in my high school because um, it was sort of decided by some powers that be evidently that, uh, you know, I would be better at uh, machine part drafting and that, you know, perhaps architecture wasn't for me. And so I had roadblocks set up for me from, from day one, from jump. 
And so, uh, you know, after a while doing the machine part drafting, trying to qualify, you know, treating it like a prerequisite, trying to qualify to get into the architecture course, you know, I realized that they had set the bar to the point where, you know, I was like numerically going to run out of semesters before I, you know, completed enough machine parts for them to deem me worthy to be in architecture. But, you know, I was going to be an architect from day one, from the time I was five or six years old, I had made that decision. And so, um, you know, off I went to architecture school, um, completely unprepared. And, uh, you know, I went to UC Berkeley and I got, I got boxed around quite a bit. Uh, that first semester was rough because, um, as he mentioned, you know, all of my, my, uh, students in my cohort had taken architecture classes in, in high school. So they were much better prepared. And so I had a lot of catching up to do. And so, uh, you know, I never felt imposter syndrome in terms of, um, you know, feeling like I didn't belong, but I, I was constantly having to play catch up from behind. Um, but what that did was it taught me to run fast and it taught me to go hard. And, uh, and you know, it, it lasted, it was that way all the way through. You know, I was, I was an athlete for, for two years in college as well. And uh, I had professors that, that wouldn't call me by my name. You know, they would, they would refer to me as Mr. Baseball Player. You know, they would refer to anybody on the basketball team as Mr. Basketball Player. They, they you know, they did everything to take uh, and challenge your, your confidence and, and challenge your position. You know, graduate school as well. I mean, I had professors at, at Parsons School of Design. I had one particular professor, um, you know, octogenarian, very famous blue blood uh, professor there who's referred to me as the black guy when he thought I, w I was out of earshot. Um, one day I heard him referring me to the black guy because I was standing right behind him. He was like, oh yeah, where's the black guy? And one of my Asian classmates was like, uh, right behind you, he turned around. He looked like he saw a ghost, but it was like, you know, I, I see you, I, I know what you're doing and it's not gonna phase me, it's not gonna dissuade me, it's not gonna stop me. Um, it's gonna make me go harder. Um, so for me, my feeling is that I've had imposter syndrome my, my entire life projected upon me, foisted upon me by professors, by other students, um, by people in the industry, you know, that make the assumption that, oh, you're, you're in the architecture field? Yeah, I'm in the architecture field. Oh, did you go to junior college or something? It's like, no, I didn't go to junior college. Oh, so you must have went, you know, to the University of Minnesota like I did. No, I didn't go to the University of Minnesota. Oh, what school did you go to? Well, I went to school on the West Coast and, uh, you know, we, we do our thing out there. Oh, yeah, well, I like the West Coast. What school? It's like, okay, I went to UC Berkeley. You know, I graduated from the College of Environmental Design at Cal. And they're like, oh. Oh yeah, well, uh, oh yeah, that's a great school. Oh yeah, it's almost the same. They're like right on the same level. They're neck and neck with the program I was in. It's just like, yeah, whatever. But it's real. And so it, 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 there's a projection that's constantly made that somehow if I'm in the room, it must be because, uh, it can't be because I'm the smartest person in the room or because you know, you know, I, I went to Parsons and, and Cal and I've, I've succeeded at, at, you know, at the top of my, my class and in, in, in every scenario I've been in, it, it has to be because, oh, he's like a diversity ad or he's like a minority person pick or he's some type of you know charity case. Like there's a reason he's here. It's not because he's qualified. So I've had that projected onto me, you know, from day one all the way, you know, from you know, grade school through through grad school and into the into the professional world. So um, you know, I, I had one brief stint I was going through some uh, mental health challenges at one point in my career and I went through a depression and uh, you know I started to feel some of the things that people had been projecting on to me you know through that process and so fighting and struggling to try to come out of that and to get myself you know back healthy again and having to take some time off um, and to be away for a while um, you know that's really the only time that I actually went through it. Um, but in retrospect, I feel like it was a response to the projection of all these years of people foisting these, you know, these falsehoods um, and this negativity upon me. And, you know, when I was at my lowest point and, uh, you know, I was struggling, that's when some of that stuff started to, you know, it's, it's in there, you know, you, you receive it, you absorb it, um, it becomes part of your being. Um, usually in normal, in normal circumstances, you, you can push it away and stiff arm it and, you know, you just keep it moving. 
But, uh, you know, when you actually go through struggles and you go through difficult times, uh, sometimes that kind of stuff can surface. And so that's been, that's been my experience in, in relationship with it. But it, it always feels like a projection. Um, it's always felt like a projection of other people, um, their low expectations for me onto me um, and not the other way around. Yeah, no, I think that you having the definition of, of it, it's, it's something that is put on um, and you have to go to war against it. You have to, you know, push against it constantly. You know, it's, it's, it's something that is tangible, but doesn't really mean it's, it's really outside of your control. And it's only based on the context around you. Um, do you have any specific way that you would sort of some concisely define that for everyone? Because I, I do appreciate the new definition sort of angle. Yeah, no, I... You know, I'm just thinking through it now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, it's to me, it always felt like um, the imposter aspect of it was something that other people felt about me and not something that I felt about myself. I always felt like I belonged. I, I always felt like I should be in the architecture courses. You know, I loved architecture. You know, they put me in machine part drafting because they had low expectations for me and they didn't think that it was gonna work out for me. Um, you know, there was always a situation, you know, they called me Mr. Baseball player because they felt like, you know, oh, I'm only here to, to play ball. I'm not serious about school. It's like, well, actually, no, I'm gonna be on the Dean's list, you know, and I'm, you know, trying to, you know, make it to the major leagues, you know, there's, there's, there's a duality. And, you know, for me, my whole life, I've had to sort of battle that in that, you know, you go to a high school um, with, you know, a strong athletic program, um, people automatically pigeonhole you into that and say, oh, well, you know, you're just, you know, whatever, you know, connotations come with being a jock or being an athlete or whatever. And it's just like, well, you know, I, that's fine. But, you know, I'm also, you know, the class salutatorian for, for my high school. So it's like, you know, I can be both and. I think that's kind of been the story of, of my life. I'm always looking for both ands. You know, I'm, I'm constantly sort of oscillating back and forth between different polarities. And, and I don't feel particularly stuck in sort of any mind state or any uh, construct at any given time. You know, I demand the freedom to be able to to be where I'm at and to feel what I'm feeling and to go through what I'm going through in that moment. And just like anybody else. And so I'm constantly sort of trying to re resist that uh, pull to just be, you know, this or that I say, I'm, I'm both. And I'm always looking for both and scenarios. You bring I appreciate it. Oops, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> There's a little bit of a delay. Go for it. Sorry. Um, no, you bring up a very good point about, uh, when you get asked about what school you go to, or you went to, I mean, when people get surprised that you get into a great school and then their reaction is like, oh, then I guess you must be smart. When sometimes they think that we don't belong in those places. Like, why are you so surprised for us to be able to attend a school just like any other white student, right? Um, and then also touching on an athlete being in a design profession, that is hard. <laughs> You are handling two difficult things at the same time because athletes are, they're very time demanding as well with all their practice and um, competitions and so forth. So the fact that you could prove that you can do both and handle them at the same time says a lot. And I mean, it goes to show that it doesn't matter that you're doing a sport while being in an architecture program. They, they shouldn't pick on you for that, right? Um, so you, you bring up an interesting point about you not feeling the imposter, but the other way around where the other people around you felt like you were the imposter. Um, do you feel that going on in, in your professional career at the moment? Oh, I definitely do. I, I, I constantly do. Um, I was literally just having this conversation last night. Uh, we are designing a memorial for Philando Castile um, here in, in the Twin Cities. You know, he was murdered, murdered by the police uh, several years ago. And um, we always have an event uh, to mark that that date at that location and we've been working for the last two and a half years with his family to his mother and his his family his siblings to uh, create a permanent memorial in his in his honor and so last night was a candlelight vigil and it was an opening of a temporary uh, peace garden um, that 
you know, some of my staff and family members and his family members and people from the community had planted um, in his honor, which is sort of a temporary um, monument to him until we can fundraise properly and, and you know, get the money to, to build a permanent memorial. And we were having that conversation actually, you know, last night with uh, some of our, our, our co-conspirators out there. And, you know, we often get bypassed for, for projects uh, that we are more than than qualified for, you know, projects that people ask us to go after, they ask us to submit for, and uh, you know, they say all these platitudes and and you know all this this tomfoolery and chicanery about, oh, we want uh, people of color, we want inclusion, we want diversity, you know, all the the catchphrases and everything else. They'll spend a whole page of their RFP talking about you know all the the you know the socially um, appropriate language for inclusion. And then you're like, okay, well, we're a multiple national award winning firm and we're extremely diverse and we're collaborating with Southeast Asian uh, visual artist or a Southeast Asian uh, literary artist and an African American visual artist. And, you know, uh, we're putting a super diverse team together and, you know, here we are. And then you don't even make it to the interview round and none of the teams that did get interviewed, have any diversity at all. And it's just like, I mean, first of all, I'm just as good an architect or better than, you know, any of these other firms, you know, that are being asked to interview. But beyond that, I'm bringing all the diversity and all of the inclusion and all the things that you're, you're verbalizing and saying that you want. And I'm bringing that all to the table. Again, it's a both and. We're both highly qualified, highly technically proficient, and we're of the community, for the community, and by the community, and we're bringing diverse elements of the community together into a package. We're your dream team. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's great, but we actually just feel more comfortable with these other guys that we've worked with before. Okay, but they've done 10 mediocre projects in the past that haven't busted a proverbial grape, and yet they want to continue in that sort of safe mode or that safe zone. And we are seen as the other, or we are seen as somehow risky, or we're seen as somehow, you know, yes, you're really talented and oh yeah, your resume looks great. Your portfolio is wonderful, but you know, we just feel more comfortable, you know, going in this other direction. So again, that, that imposter ism is constantly being projected on us that we're somebody that you can't feel comfortable with. We're somebody that, although we're talented and we're smart and you can't take that away from us, we're somehow, we're being othered into this, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's like the platonic friend zone uh, with a love interest, right? You get sort of like, you know, put into that zone and then it's like, you know, you never, you never get access. So that's kind of what we struggle with all the time to this day. And I'm sick of losing projects to people that absolutely have, you know, zero credentials, zero credibility in the marketplace, do mediocre work at best, and constantly sort of just represent the, the, the white privilege patriarchy, right? But mediocrity and, and white privilege patriarchy wins 99% of the time. So um, so yes, I feel it a lot in, in my work, but again, it's projected against me, um, often by clients, clients that say they want what they want, but you present them with what they've said. And then it's like, uh, actually, I think we'll just go back to the mediocre, you know, thing that we're, we're comfortable with. So it's about being othered constantly and, and put in a place other than the one that you've earned or, or the position that you know, your, your work, the quality of your work merits. No, those are wonderful sentiments. And I, the confidence to, to speak and the, the conviction that you speak with is, is um, inspiring and awe. It's, I'm in awe over here. Um, I'd like to get Roger um, in actually as, as uh, a little bit um, off of that. Um, you know, giving people and children specifically a place that they don't feel like the other, that they can explore themselves. And I think I, I would, gather that uh you know james founding one of the studios that inspiration does come through uh at, at your facility uh, as well um could you give us a little bit uh, of your your viewpoint and unpack your experience with um with this syndrome whether it's a projected pond felt the projection or, or something totally different 
Sure. Now, so this is why I mess with James because of that confidence. And he's, yeah, he's able to um, give me mad jewels, like I was saying before. Um, but he also gives uh, the young people a lot of jewels as their instructor. It's like critique is hard. It, he makes it happen. And he's a team that's like that too. So it's not just him. It's, you know, him, um, you know, Sean uh, Ascarfrey. He has like a, like, like a team. So the young people get this and they are light years ahead. Um, you, know, you know, they know how to talk about their work. They know architectural, landscape architecture, urban planning theory. They um, have worked on real world projects. Um, they know a lot of the software, your SketchUps, your, you know, your Adobe Suites, your Rhinos, things like that. And then when they get into college, they run into the same shit, the same thing. And so being two and three times better hasn't what white supremacy yet. And, and so like my son's a senior in Parsons now who started studying under James and Satoko and um, uh, uh, Sam Babatunde um, and is light years ahead and, um, but is still getting the business and still having professors like, you know, you should go somewhere. He's, he's, he's like one of two undergrad architecture at Parsons, one of two black um, young people. So just so, like I was 20 years ago, the exact, he's going through the exact same thing. I try to prepare him for hope, hope, hoping that things would evolve and change in that time. But he's literally, when I go out to visit him, he's literally going through the exact same stuff. Yeah, so they so they're trying to weed him out, and you know, he, if he didn't have that confidence to have mentors that were that were strong like that, he would have been. He'd, he's he's watching other peers get crushed, and so that's so that's super problematic. So imposter syndrome for me, um, I would say. So like my foundation is being a b boy. I was a pro pro professional b boy um, in you know like ninth grade. I had a manager. I toured and whatever. Um, I, made, I made money. Yep, absolutely. Um, I'm also an aerosol writer, so it's like I can, I can, I can still paint, you know, I, you know, we used to paint on, you know, on trains and on, on walls, things like that. So that's my foundation, which means I was really good at art in school, but I was super crappy at regular grades. <clears throat> and so I, I had to drop out of high school because there was too many credits ahead of me and I would have been like 24 by the time I got out. So I dropped out, I dropped out of high school and my airbrush t-shirt manager, cause I used to do airbrush t-shirts. Um, who was my girlfriend at the time um, was she, she didn't drop out but she was like like last in the class <clears throat> so um, me her and, and another person ended up founding Juxta and one of my mentors would say you need to go to this program that I went to at Harvard called the Low Fellowship and it, there's like no way it's, it's like no, no way I, I didn't go I didn't get through undergrad and I didn't I don't have I only have my GED so there's no way I'm not even entertaining it then um, my wife decides to go to grad school and gets into the um, Kennedy School. And so it's like, oh man, now, now that's, that's like horrible. She's going to go there and meet <clears throat> like Skip Gates and they're going to run off together. And I, like, 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 like what's going to happen? So um, then I actually apply and I get in. And so I get in, we both go to Harvard together. She's doing policy, I'm doing design. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the GSD and I'm having um, dinner and chopping it up with like, um, Phil Freelon all the time, David J, uh, you know, Renzo Piano, um, uh, Elizabeth, like, 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 like the who's who of making the magic happen. Um, and, and like, so I'm, start, I'm, I'm like, I'm the only one that doesn't have like a, like a, like a high school diploma in this, in this, in this joint. But then when we go down and are studying urbanism and urban planning and architecture in Rio, um, I'm chopping it up with, uh, Oscar Niemeyer, and he's putting me on to game, and all the rest of the architects who wanted to. So I was trying to stay out of the picture and not because I really didn't know who Oscar Niemeyer was like that. And he saw that and he pulled me, and I sat beside him. He held my hand and was just like dropping science, like the whole. And, and I'm like, <clears throat> there's no way that I should be here. It's like I know how to write bubble letters. I know how to do like a like a piece on a train. I know how to tag and the whole thing. And it's like I'm just getting put up on all this all this environmental design game and um so that's 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 like probably one of the one of the main things that like was giving me imposter syndrome the, the people in my class who it was like a cohort model the people in my team were uh, a woman who was the chief architect for the kingdom of bhutan another woman who was the chief architect of shanghai and it's like i don't have architecture degree one much less undergrad so <clears throat> that's that that was making me feel <clears throat> mad um 
uh, impostery, I guess. Uh, but on the back of that, once I got back <clears throat> to Minneapolis, um, we, we took <clears throat> Juxta to a whole new level. It, it's, it's, like, it's like people have the perception that since you and your homegirl who, is, who, who, who I'm married to are, are, are now kind of blessed in a way, it's like, getting, it's like getting jumped into the crypts and being able to come back on the block, like holding it down, like people were bowing down. And it's like, then I can hold my own with the architects um, to some degree who I know are mediocre. And so me, James, Nate, like we have a whole team that can go into places and just like fry, fry yeah. the mediocrity. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like, it was hard when it was, when we were going through it, but it was rewarding at the other side. So we, so we bring those, <clears throat> that kind of energy into the classes at Juxta when we're teaching young people about, um, you know, good architecture, um, abject mediocrity, Paul Bunyanism, um, urban, pl like all, all those different things that they can get in their tool bag and, or their toolbox and be able to go out into the world and have support and have the language and have the, the experiences that people twice their age don't, don't have. Why do you think uh, Harvard was willing to give, because I mean, I, I have the master's degree and I still don't think I'm qualified to, to attend Harvard. What, what do you think was special about the, the Harvard uh, experience that really welcomed you, uh, you know, up front if you didn't think you were necessarily qualified compared to the cohort? Well, how did that, how did that encourage you as well? How did that, so, <clears throat> well, like the resources that, that they have, so the, as far as bringing people there to, to, to be able to, to, to like, <clears throat> um, you know, to, to learn, to talk, to, to, to uh, experiment. And like the program just, just wasn't at Harvard. It's like when, when you're in that program, they give you access to any school in Boston. So I could take classes. I took class at MIT, uh, BU, Tufts. Um, I can go to any school in Harvard, medical school, policy school, uh, divinity school, like, like any of that, like you get all that access. And so that's, that's like huge. And so you can read, study, create alliances. Yeah, it's like being in a little baby Illuminati in a way. But, and that's why I was like, yo, <clears throat> it was, yeah, it was, it was like a little frightening. No, beautiful. Um, so one thing we do talk about here at, and I think it relates a little bit to your um, juxta juxtaposition, um, is this concept of sacred space and a place that people feel that they can be safe and themselves. Um, and uh, everyone has their own definition of what sacred space is. And this year, especially um, with Designing Color, that's been one of our main themes. And in, in, that, in that search, the sort of uh, imposter syndrome is one of the direct combatants to having a space that is a sacred space for us and a place for us. Um, do any of three of you want to, you know, chime in on what your definition of that sacred space might be and how you know you um, have about, found an ability to create it uh, against the, <clears throat> the general um, odds of this this pressure put on from external um, gaze yeah uh, I can sort of kick it off I guess um, Roger and I actually taught uh, a studio workshop at the University of Minnesota um, where I'm an adjunct instructor, uh, I don't know, was it like three years ago on uh, contemplation space? And so I feel like that's maybe a similar sort of concept, but we were really looking to have students really think through what spaces make them feel comfortable, what spaces make them feel safe, uh, what are the characteristics, what are the qualities that those spaces have, where are those spaces? Um, you know, we, we really wanted to open them up to some conceptual thought and we got some really, really, um, dope ideas out of the students. And it was something that, you know, I learned a lot from myself. So one of the things for me is I'm a rooftop person. Um, you know, I learned that about myself living in New York. Um, for me, sacred space is quiet space. And in the city where I've always lived in one city or another in the Bay Area, um, you know, wherever I've lived, I've always sought some type of quiet, right? So I like quiet sort of within the energy of the city. I borrow the energy of the city. I believe in the embodied energy theories that, that basically talk about, um, you know, the, the accumulation of the experiences and the energy and the effort 
put into the creation of something, you know, in the larger sense, uh, put into the creation of the city, right, into the, the public spaces, into the buildings, into, you know, the religious uh, uh, and ecclesiastic spaces, you know, all of that energy, all of that knowledge, uh, everything over periods of time uh, put into that, they resonate and they, they emanate outward um, from the cities. I'm always attracted to cities. Um, I feel more comfortable in cities, but I'm always looking for these quiet spaces within the city to be able to reflect and to contemplate. And so for me, there's, there's a sacred in that. And living in New York, um, climbing up the fire escape and going up onto our rooftop uh, on when I lived on, on 21st and, and Broadway uh, was my sanctuary. And so I've always, when I came back from New York, I, one of the things that I always do is I integrate rooftop space into every building that I design. Um, it's something that I think is mad important. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an empath. So I put myself into uh, the buildings and and the places that I design. And I always think, man, you know, this would be like a dope contemplation place for somebody. This would be like a dope space for somebody. And so uh, that's one of the things that 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 I do. The other thing that, that we did recently on a project that just finished last year uh, that Roger worked on with us was we did a 72 unit supportive housing project for uh, primarily black men who have been homeless or at risk of homelessness due to prior incarceration. And one of the skills that they were learning in the program that they're participating in um, is about conflict resolution and about de-escalation. And so as we're learning that, Roger's doing this, uh, this eight part engagement work with these guys and doing arts-based activities, really getting to know them, getting to understand their, their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations, their, their struggles, their challenges. We started to realize that we need spaces that support, uh, you know, the work that that's being done with them. So we created on two floors at each end of each floor, we created con uh, meditation spaces is what they're called meditation rooms. And so they function as spaces where if guys aren't getting along with uh, the people in their, in their, uh, in their area, um, or for whatever reason, there's a space at the end of the hall, they can close the door, they can look out the window, and they can reflect. And it's a, it's a place of pause, it's a place, place of contemplation, it's a place of meditation. You know, some folks, um, you know, turn to Islam, um, they discover Islam um, when they're incarcerated and away from society. And so this is a space that those guys can pray um, when they need to pray. Um, so it, 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 it's a de facto sacred space, and it's something that we started to integrate into um, the buildings, the supportive housing and the residential buildings that we create. So it's kind of twofold. It's like, you know, you know, I always push for rooftop access, um, but I also listen to the population that is going to be inhabiting that space. And, you know, in this case, these guys were, they were learning that conflict resolution and that that sort of de-escalation and being able to walk away and take deep breaths and, and get space from conflict in order to de-escalate. And they needed space for that to happen. And it wasn't gonna happen, you know, it wasn't in the program that the client gave us, it wasn't the program the developer gave us, but it was, it was something that we learned about going through the process. And so we were able to move rooms around and we were able to borrow some square footage from here and there and we were able to create these spaces and they're some of the most used spaces even when it, when it was under construction it wasn't finished yet and some of the guys had moved in those rooms whenever i would go on a field visit those rooms you could tell the furniture was always moved around there was like you could see those spaces had been occupied um you know so even from day one before the facility officially opened those those contemplative spaces those those meditative spaces, those sacred spaces were, were spaces that were immediately gravitated to and were utilized. So, so yeah. And how would you encourage, sorry, go ahead, Roger, jump in. No, go ahead. You're, you're the star of the show tonight, so you guys are the stars. So I just want to make the, the differentiation between safe space um, and, and like non-safe space. So like I would see a non-safe space as like, let's say walking through Bensonhurst. <clears throat> or Howard Beach or Murray Hill in Cleveland, places that you know people are going to come for you and come out of your house and like like that whole thing. As compared to a space like a, I don't, I don't, it's a you know kind of an 
old term, but like, you know, having like a pop lock battle or having, um, or, a, or a MC cypher where, or even um, a, a architecture crit with German professors. It's like the worst that's gonna happen to you is you're gonna get roasted. And, you know, like, 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 like the question is, do you want me to be sensitive to your feelings or do you want me to be real with you? And, and so like, people could see that it's unsafe, but that's a very constructive space. So, so like we build spaces in an area where people, you know, su supposedly there's, there's like high crime, like the misery index area um, in North Minneapolis. And we created a skate park there with benches and you can, you know, you can have lunch and we have parklets and things like that. Um, and we have 70 young people there a year. And we've been doing that, you know, we're on our 25th year and like nobody's been shot yet. And, and so like that is like a sacred safe space as is as is the campus even though um you do get critiqued hard um there are some tears uh there is a lot of learning and it's and it's not easy so like 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 safe space doesn't mean that there's it's not competitive and there's no hoops to jump through um but it's it's all love and it's very supportive and Nate, do you want to jump in on that too Did we lose Nate? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I was saying I really like what you said there because it kind of took me back to uh, sort of my childhood and my teenage years growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in. And when we talk about places that were safe and places that were, you know, unsafe and the places that you had the most creativity you kind of lost yourself in your in your in your mind in a sense um and just you were one with what was around you and i just think of the characteristics of some of those spaces so one of them for me was uh, a park that we used to call out back so after school every day we used to go out there and we played basketball there was a huge like football field out there and there was a, a little basketball court with with two two nets on it and just the feeling that I got when I was when I was in that space, even when I didn't really know how to play basketball that much, you know, it was a feeling. It was it felt like an oasis. So it felt like I could leave home. You know, I could I could I could be there for long periods of time. And that just sort of the characteristics of those space uh, of that space would be something that I would kind of integrate in. You know, another uh, uh, design to make a safe space or an, or an oasis for people to learn and think and all that stuff. And sort of for me, what I like to do is usually take elements from, you know, other things and the feelings and the emotions and, you know, components from them, extract those things um, as, you know, literally like almost like line items and try to uh, directly correlate them with ways that you can create an indoor, you know, space or urban space. Um, so I can imagine like with that space, I realized that it was, it was uh, very open, you know, and, and I can imagine you know, that you look up and you see the sky, you know, so things like that, you know, would be some things that I would integrate into uh, sort of like, a, let's, let's say an interior space to where it feels open, you have the windows, you have very, you know, calm colors, very uh, lighter, brighter, you know, colors. Um, and then also another piece and component of, of that place was what we call a draw. So you had the basketball court, which allowed, allowed people to, um, to uh, collaborate or allow people to uh, talk to each other and, and, and uh, practice teamwork and all those different types of things. And I can imagine, you know, in, in, a, in an interior space, you create like a draw, like, a, like an art piece or, you know, something that allows people to have discussion and dialogue uh, and connect with each other. So that's kind of what I think when I think of like a, a safe space. So before we uh, go any further, we were uh, thinking uh, good conversation so far. If you guys are open for uh, another maybe 20 minutes of open chat, and then we open up some questions so we don't keep you guys too long. Maybe at the 90-minute uh, mark, any objections? Hey, I've got I've got plenty of Guinness. I can I can go all night. So beautiful. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. I, I appreciate everyone's uh, different take on that, especially uh, jumping in there and and. That's what we've learned, uh, especially in DC out here, is finding that sacred space is a very nuanced, individual type thing. Uh, how do you guys find 
um, that you challenge the sort of group think, uh, perhaps when what James said, the, the developer mentality, the, the white mentality of what might be the appropriate response uh, to some of those. What are, your, what are your positions other than at the end of the day, look, it frickin' works, you know, and it gives people that space. How do, you, how do you sell that? How do you encourage that, especially going forward so that we have these spaces that do exist and they're not cut out of budget items, they're not, you know, ignored, and, and those voices do have a chance to, to be in a, in a place, whether it's urban, architectural, um, you know, even, even creating their own pieces, but uh, really encourages that. Well, one of the strategies that I've learned is that you can't leave anything sort of loose and, you know, there's no loose appendages. Everything has to be essential and completely integrated into the essence of whatever it is you're doing. Because developers, uh, clients, whomever, will always look for an opportunity to take the shortcut and to chop it off. So if it's a loose appendage, boom, it becomes, uh, <laughs> it becomes calamari, right? So um, we have to like really be tight about sort of how we do things. So the first way that I've learned to do it is to create a process that is iterative and it's upfront with the client and they understand very clearly that we're going to be learning our way through this. We don't have all the answers. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but through this process of discovery, we are going to discover um, a path to take that is going to be qualitatively superior to whatever the spreadsheet that you gave us was, whatever your preconceived ideas are, whatever my preconceived ideas are, right? An iterative process that works through um, the stakeholders and uh, it really engages with end users is in my experience always qualitatively superior to just, just rushing in and, and doing a thing. So uh, we create a process um, where there's a lot of listening, there's a lot of engaging. Um, we have dialogue, uh, we're able to sort of take notes. We try to run that process parallel uh, to the design process so that uh, schematic design is happening as these conversations um, and these relationships are forming. And so things aren't set in stone yet. Things haven't been priced yet. There's no cost to having a meditation space yet right nothing so things are a little bit more malleable and you can start to integrate those things into the the essence of of whatever that that place is right away so it makes it a lot tougher if the developer and the client and everybody has started to see these spaces almost from the beginning early on they get used to seeing them and then it's not like an add-on or an appendage at the end right it's it's integral to the process and it's it's it's, an, it's a much easier sell. The second thing that we do um, is what I had to do with, with our integrated architecture, which is one of the things that I've been traveling around the country the last four years or so um, speaking on. Um, it is, I had to really make it into something that there was no separate line item in, in the budget for it. If you look at our projects, there's no line item for art in the budget. Art is literally integrated into every single aspect. And whichever artists uh, are on our team, and there's always an artist at the table on our team from proposal uh, moving forward. Um, we have those conversations early on, like are there specific surfaces uh, that are important that we can make a difference, whether it be color, texture, um, some type of uh, artistic outcome from the engagement process, whatever it is, where are some strategic areas that we can integrate this into the building so that again it doesn't appear on a line item the building has to have paint some kind of wall treatment or wall covering anyway so if roger does something dope that we're able to to replicate and integrate into the that wall surface then that's just part of the wall covering budget right part of the paint budget you know roger selected all the paint color all of our contrast walls you know throughout you know, all the levels of this, this sort of housing project that we did. So again, you know, art was able to be integrated and, and there was nowhere for anybody to try to cut it because it was literally part of the process and it was integrated into the building. So those are the two strategies that, that I've developed over time because as a younger architect, I kept seeing anything artistic that I tried to, to implement as a visual artist myself, just get painfully, you know, lopped off at the at the at the source and so you know those strategies have have been effective so far so far so good